The Metal Gear series first stole onto the scene and snuck inside the game industry's heart way back in 1987. But the events of the original title that began the saga would not be especially returned to by the wider storyline until the very last entry. Last with its true creator, Hideo Kojima anyway, 2015's Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain. This is a video essay slash investigation into how the first Metal Gear, or Alpha for the series, fits together with the so-called missing link to unite the entire series. It's Omega, the final chapter, Metal Gear Solid V. From here on out, you're big boss. Just as a refresher, here's what happens in Metal Gear 87. Metal Gear, from the start, is a story of civil war, specifically one waged within the SOF, or Special Forces Unit, Foxhound. Led by the Cold War legend and father of modern-day Special Forces, Big Boss, Foxhound is tasked with investigating the clandestine, next-gen nuclear program of a certain army without a country, the outfit known as Outer Heaven. When Foxhound's best operative, codenamed Grey Fox, goes MIA inside the Outer Heaven Fortress inside South Africa, the rookie, codenamed Solid Snake, embarks on a Heart of Darkness or Apocalypse Now style odyssey, one deep behind enemy territory. To save Fox, solve the mystery of the weapon codenamed Metal Gear, and ultimately track down and neutralize the elusive enemy commander, who just so happens to be your own Big Boss. The game of finishing your mission involves rescuing POWs, which raises your rank. But just as crucially to building up your arsenal, the POWs provide you with intel you'll desperately need to win. So too do the handful of radio contacts that you'll assemble, from members of the local resistance cell fighting in this civil war in Outer Heaven, to your CO, Big Boss himself, whose advice is admittedly not always the most trustworthy or timely. Like so often in Metal Gear Solid V, in Metal Gear 87, you're sent in to fill in the missing pieces of what's really going on behind the shadows, vital intelligence that's needed before action can be planned. First, Snake tracks down Grey Fox in the isolation ward of this giant Gitmo-esque prison camp in South Africa by letting himself get captured. But it turns out the enemy saw this ruse coming. They ambush you, like the start of Phantom Pain, at your most naked and vulnerable here. Scrambling to recover, Snake gets back his gear and endeavors to reach the second high-value target, the engineer Dr. Petrovich Madnar. Believing him to be held in the courtyard in max security, Snake must procure and exploit enemy gear like the parachute to move forward. But he's ambushed again and again. It's like someone, someone other than your extremely trustworthy CEO Big Boss, of course, is watching every move. By the time you reach the courtyard, you're too late, Snake. Madnar's been moved 10 kilometers to the north across a barren desert and awaiting you there, in Building 2, are even more deadly foes and maze-like corridors, some of them patrolled by near-immortal-seeming Terminators slash Frankenstein's monsters. Finally, though, you will learn the enemy was holding Dr. Modnar's daughter hostage to force him to help construct their nuclear trump card. It's a bipedal weapons platform, Metal Gear. Despite Big Boss's attempts at counterintelligence and sabotage, eventually you destroy Metal Gear and defeat the man who sold you this world of lies, Big Boss in the flesh. Supposedly. Big Boss explains to your face, or alleges, that he only gave you this mission believing that you'd surely fail. He tells you, I won't die for nothing, you die with me. But Snake, just barely, survives against Metal Gear, Big Boss, and the Outer Heaven self-destruct sequence. Once Snake's out of range, the facility gets doubly destroyed, this time by a NATO airstrike. The world's been made safe, for now. We'll use two lines of attack here. One, design, and two, story slash lore. Know something about what's going on. 
He was transferred to the Soviet's base camp. I've marked it on the map. Make your way to that base camp. The design parallels between Metal Gear 87 and MGS5 are plentiful. Let's briefly analyze or at least enumerate a few of them. 1. POWs. Both games build both main and side objectives around rescuing detainees while conducting your mission. 2. Enemy mecha slash armor slash etc. Both games feature not only man versus man conflicts, but man versus machine bouts of asymmetrical special forces meets anime action. You take on tanks, planes, and bipedal robots, as well as, of course, three sci-fi spy action. Terminators, Blade Runners, and Dracula, oh my. Both titles, Metal Gear 87 and The Phantom Pain, resemble one of my Japanese animes or something. Four. Let's just do a quick list of some of the design features implemented first by Metal Gear 87 and show up in The Phantom Pain. Guard shifts, fake outs, body doubles. Bad intel. Moving targets. Supply farming, locational checkpoints, RPG elements, at least in terms of progression, and war crimes. Metal Gear 87 even attempted something like sandbox game design, branching out in all directions as it does with missable and modular weapons and items for your procurement. Though most of these do have to be obtained eventually, and tracking them down can sometimes be a real pain, the order often depends on you. In both games, if you wind up in front of a boss lacking the right gear just yet, you can retreat, usually, and track down your gear or level up Snake before trying again. Of course, the two design scenarios for Metal Gear 87 that particularly stand out next to MGS5 are the body double and the enemy disguise sections, which we'll turn to now with part two, story slash lore. Two, story slash lore. In one memorable scene from Metal Gear 87, the enemy uses a body double of our rescue target, Dr. Madnar, to lure Snake to his death. In another sequence, we have to find and utilize a proper disguise of our own to infiltrate Big Boss's inner sanctum. These scenarios take on new meaning in light of MGS5. As I said, the Phantom Pain explains that the Big Boss we fight to the death in Metal Gear 87 is actually Punished Venom Snake, the protagonist from MGS V in disguise. Let's unpack this fully together. We're told that from the very start of the Venom Snake Big Boss doppelganger ruse, essentially, that Venom Snake's mission was designed to culminate in some sick reprisal of the events of Operation Snake Eater in MGS3, with he serving essentially, when you think about it, as some stand-in for the boss, and Solid Snake, one of Big Boss's clones, of course, playing the role of Naked Snake. This means that, just like behind the scenes of MGS3, in Metal Gear 87, each of the bosses you fight are secretly sacrificing themselves for the completion of your mission. You're really sort of on the same side in some weird way, as you tend to be in these games. Just like in Metal Gear Solid 3, the events of the game amount to a kind of rigged or predetermined course of events meant to force a passing of the torch, so to speak, from one generation of America's beautiful monsters to the next from one version of Big Boss to another. And in so doing, the cycle that the boss sort of lays out is yet again fulfilled, as it will be a third time with the end of Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake. Let's cycle back to the fact that Big Boss in Metal Gear 87 is actually our player character from Metal Gear Solid 5, Venom Snake. This would entail that, well, if we wanted to read into it just ever so slightly, 
that it seems Venom Snake is constantly setting you up in Metal Gear 87 for betrayals and mind games, all because the outcome has been preordained against him. The name's Ocelot. Big boss. You know who I am. A certain man gave me a job to do. Two, actually. The first was to get you out of that hospital. The second was to rescue the man himself. You remember? It's likely these little radio moments in Metal Gear 87 have, after MGS5 has recontextualized them, kind of given them this new meaning of being Venom Snake's sort of last spiteful, petty moments of still getting to be Big Boss. And all of the abuse that he sort of like rains down on you in that game is sort of a consequence of the events of the Phantom Pain. That's right, the hatred and resentment that Venom Snake has for Big Boss and Cypher, not to mention the guilt by his direct association with them and his part-time disassociative identification with Big Boss himself, well, with all that in the background, given the end of Metal Gear Solid V, all this stuff just serves as venom for Venom Snake, a poison that he was intentionally sort of infected with in order to one day in a sort of nod, of course, to the Fox Die virus from Metal Gear Solid 1, serve as a kind of vector. It's all to motivate his fight against Big Boss's other stand-in, Solid Snake. He'll carry the vector of vengeance with him over the decades from one generation to the next. And this is, of course, deeply ironic. Basically, Metal Gear 87 and parts of MGSV, or 5, everyone in the comments, stop form a mirror image, setting up a revolutionary innovation. Whereby, thanks to the power of retconning, it's made as though history and the player alike have forgotten that once we were leading the other side. This is a sort of feedback loop. Uh, we're colliding with ourselves in the final boss fight of Metal Gear 87, you see? One player character meeting and fighting another. It's arguably only thanks to the original game's technological limitations which was always something that Kojima worked very hard to make into its strong point. Its relative lack of dialogue, say. It's thanks to stuff like that that this conceit I'm describing really becomes possible. All either you as Snake or the game as Big Boss can do here uh, is, is pretty primitive. It comes from a pretty short list of commands and moves. So it's pretty hard to tell you apart, really, if you, if you just saw footage of this final fight. You wouldn't really, uh, out of context, you know, uh, you couldn't really say which was the computer and which was the man. And I know that sounds kind of ridiculous, but this is Metal Gear. And when you think about it, given the context that MGS5 gives it, you know, there's something there. Fighting Big Boss at the end of the game becomes retroactively, at least in theory, some kind of massive fourth wall break. It's a simulation of not the computer, but the player playing against itself. Big Boss here is, in other words, a copy of you that as Snake, you must destroy and ultimately replace to become the next generation's greatest living mercenary legend. In the end, Metal Gear Solid V and Metal Gear 87 both enrich and complement each other grandly from the opposite ends of the series' spectrum. MGS5 makes many more covert allusions and suggestions in terms of how to read or reassess the events of Metal Gear in much more detail or with many more uh, possible suggestions being made there than I have really room to cover here. But playing either game, even if you don't go through every single secret or hint that's given away as to how things connect together and how the story ultimately fits together, you'll be given a sense of weird continuity of symmetry to the entire saga, especially if you play one in light of the other, the beginning in terms of the end, the end in terms of the beginning. That's yet another sense, I guess, in which it'll never be game over. The loop just feeds into itself, coiling, I guess you could say, like a snake. Until next time, boss. Boss.